السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So inshallah ta'ala um, as we have been doing looking at the a hadith from Arba'ina al-Nawi the 40 hadith of Imam al-Nawi we almost finished uh, so we'll look at another hadith tonight uh, this is a hadith collected in Sahih Muslim and it's narrated by Al-Nawas ibn Sam'an radiyallahu anhu who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Al-Birru husnul al khuluq Piety, being pious, righteous, means having noble character, having good character. And there's another hadith in relation to this, which Imam al nawi brought. And this is from the Musnad of Imam Ahmed, narrated by Wabisa bin Ma'bad, radiallahu anhu, that he said that a man once came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that جئت تسأل عن عن البر والإثم. A man came to ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about bir, meaning piety, righteousness, and ithm, sin, or any type of transgression where you cross the limits set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the man came and asked about these two matters. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took his fingers uh, like, you know, hit him on his chest, like this is a serious matter you asked about. And then he answered the person by saying that, Istafti qalbik, ask your own soul, ask your heart, see that feeling or the thought that you get. About when? That, Al birru ma atma'annat ilayhi nafs wa atma'anna ilayhi al qalb. That righteousness, when you have bir and you understand righteousness, your heart or your soul will be at ease. Drinking water, is this halal or haram? You have an easy feeling. Halal, you know, you get that feeling. So something that is pious, righteous, it's a good thing to do, you will feel peace in your heart when you do it. Right? And as for ithm, as for any type of sin, that ma haka fi nafsi, wa taradda fi sadri wa in aftaka nasu aftauk, aftauk. That if uh, ithm, the sin, this is something that makes your heart restless, right? And it brings hesitation to your heart, even if you ask the people about it. If you ask the people. Wa in aftak. Even if you go and ask for a fatwa, and I'll explain this further, or uh, or if you aftak, or if you go um, telling, if you tell people, whether you ask for a fatwa or you tell, if some sin is involved, you will not feel at ease. So this is the difference between pious good actions and bad actions, right? So, um, as we can see, uh, as we'll see, that of course, inshallah, in this hadith, the one who understands this, you can save yourself from a lot of trouble if you understand and implement this hadith. That before any type of action that you want to do that comes to your mind, the feeling that you get, you can seriously think about it. Ask yourself, see what type of feeling you're getting in your heart. Are you feeling easy? Right? Like let's suppose someone's trying to steal money. He's restless, constantly walking, uh, watching. Is there any cameras? Is somebody here? Anybody can hear me? Okay, nobody's here. Let me... Why so much hard work? Because it's a haram action. But when you go to work, you're doing a lawful job, uh, or, or whatever may be the case, you have no problem. You're, you're at ease. You're working, earning your money, no problem. Because that's a good action. It's a halal action. So, that feeling that you get, the piety, that al-bir, husn al-khuluq, righteousness is having good character. This is the first point in the hadith. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى Help each other 
in doing what is good and help each other gain the taqwa. Right? This is what the Muslims are supposed to do with one another. Right? وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ Do not help each other commit sin and transgression. So this is a very important ayah. Because you have to remember many times, if you want to do good things, many times you will not be able to do it by yourself. Right? You won't be able to do it by yourself. Because there are many good things that require more than two hands and two feet. You literally need like, you know, 20 arms and 20 feet and so on. So you'll need other help. Like look at Musa alayhi salam. When Allah made him his Rasul and told him to go to Fir'aun, he asked Allah, let my brother Harun come with me. Right? Sometimes you need help to do good things. Or uh, look at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam during his hijrah. Who was with him? His, when he migrated. Of course, the Muslims left before. Who was with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam? Abu Bakr. All right. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alright, so Abu Bakr, his friend of 40 years, he was always there. Abu Bakr took his shahada, brought like 10 more people. He didn't stop there. No, I'm going to help Rasulullah. Sallallahu right? Or, or, so there's always, Muslims are supposed to help each other for uh, bir and taqwa. That if you have good ideas, good concepts, whatever it is, you guys work together for the good. Work together to help each other becoming more religious. But when you have sinful ideas, trends, uh, or oppressive ideas and plans and this and that, then of course you don't help each other. Right? Do not help each other when it comes to sinning or committing acts of transgression. Like someone wants to rob a bank, it's like, brother, you know what? I'm a really fast driver. I'll drive you but I'm not going to go inside. The rest is up to you. No, you're helping him. You're also a robber. <laughs> so, so this is the concept, that you cannot help in sin or transgression. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Birru uh, husn al-Khuluq, that piety is noble character. You have to have character, your behavior, that we can easily say that someone who doesn't have manners, ah, he doesn't have taqwa of Allah. We always say this. Because manners and taqwa, or bir, righteousness, is connect connected. If someone doesn't have good behavior, right? For sure he's not going to perform his Islamic duties. He's a rude person, doesn't know how to talk, or has no character whatsoever, no shame. He's going to fail in Islam miserably, right? And this is something like, it doesn't mean that al-bir husn al that this is what it is. The righteousness means good character. Without good character, you don't have any righteousness. No, good character is part of righteousness. Salah, siyam, zakat, all these are righteous actions, good actions. But one of the major actions of fulfilling bir is husn al having good manners. This is similar to the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Hajju Arafah. Everybody who has made Hajj, you know how important Arafah is. But, so this hadith is saying, the Hajj is Arafah. On the, standing on Yawm Al-Arafah, standing on the mountain, right? This is like the greatest day, the biggest pillar. But is someone's Hajj accepted without Tawaf, without uh, Sa'i, without this, without so many other pillars? Right? But it's an emphasis that Arafah is such a great event, such a major part of Hajj. Like, right? Without it, you have no Hajj. But there are other pillars too, without which your Hajj would be invalid. But this is the more, like, really emphasized pillar. So, same thing here. That Al Birru Husn Al Khuluq. There's many righteousness, righteous actions you can do. However, <coughs> having good manners, good character, this is a major part of it. Right? That you be humble, you have good manners in whatever good you do. And there's a hadith the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in Sahih al Bukhari. Those who have akhlaq, meaning good manners, in jahiliyyah will also have good manners in Islam. 
and this is true. When you find new Muslims, those who are raised in a certain way, a disciplined way, having good manners, even though their parents may have been Christians, Jews, atheists, whatever may be the case, but they had moral values, they had discipline, they knew how to interact with people. So when that person takes his shahada, he becomes the best of Muslims because he already had good manners before he even became Muslim. So that's the meaning of the hadith. That those who are the best in jahiliyyah, even among the mushrikun, they are the best of the people, the most trustworthy, uh, good people, sincere people. Once they take their shahada, they become the best of the Muslims. And then of course you have other ahadith that sometimes this akhlaq and adab, these manners, it is a natural thing that Allah blesses certain people with. Just like knowledge. Some people, let's give a dunya example. There are many students out there, uh, you know, and I've met many. They'll literally play basketball, play this, play that, hours a day. Few, you know, they just do their homework, finish their projects, A grade students. Then there are other students, they study for 10 hours a day, still can get a maximum of B. This is the reality of Bani Adam. So sir, just like that, everything that you have, the gift is from Allah. Some people have more, some people have less. So same thing with manners. Some people naturally are inclined towards good manners. And you'll find many children, subhanAllah, maybe their father is the worst person, the most foul mouth. The mother has the most foul mouth, but subhanAllah, in that house, the child has beautiful manners. It's from Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ said, many people, they have this gift from Allah. Other people, they have to work on their manners. Maybe naturally Allah didn't give him, but he has to learn trial and error. Today you spoke this way, you hurt people's feelings. You learned a lesson. Tomorrow, stop saying this. Today you did this, that's rude, this is that. You learn. And every day you learn, you correct your mistakes. Whenever you learn something, you see that this is a mistake, you make islah, rectify yourself, right? This is the journey of most Muslims, right? That we all make mistakes every day, but every day is a learning process. So you work and you build, you build. But the point is, continuously and intentionally having bad manners is not acceptable. That is not acceptable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then there's another hadith the Prophet sallallahu said on Yawmul Qiyamah, uh, on the Mizan, the scale, the heaviest thing for, for a believer will be Husnul Khuluq, his good manners. So how you deal with people, when you talk about manners, it's number one is how you deal with Allah. Do you behave with Allah properly? That's not first and foremost. Then, do you behave with the people properly, right? So, uh, that we can't have monkey business and this and that with people, right? You have to behave honestly, sincerely, open-heartedly with everybody. So this is why you see from the Sahaba, like for example, Abdullah ibn Umar, and men, all of them, all of them, but this is just one example. Somebody comes and says, Uhibbuka fillah, I love you for the sake of Allah. But maybe the guy committed a sin. And Abdullah ibn Umar would tell him on his face, I hate you for the sake of Allah, because of this thing that you just did. Very honest, right? They didn't put a smile on your face <laughs> and plan on stabbing you from the back. That was not the way of the Sahaba. That if I like you, I'll tell you. If I don't like you, you'll see from my face. That's from the manners of Islam. And it prevents problems, right? Like let's say, even in any community or family, if someone is straightforward, what does people say? Ah, yeah, yeah, that brother's tough and he's straightforward. That's it. That is at most someone will say. But someone who backbites, smiles, at, there's like a million things. Oh, that guy, he's a cheat, he's a liar, he smiles, he's a fake. It's, the list goes on and on and on and on. But someone who is straightforward, that's it. Yeah, he's very upfront, straightforward. That's, it stops right there. <laughs> <laughs> Even the backbiting is limited for this person, alhamdulillah, right? So you have to think this, 
So all of this is from the good manners of Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Indeed, you have been given the best of the characters. You're the best example. No one can have better manners or better character than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? And you are the standard that if someone wants to know what is the Islamic adab, look at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is the standard. This is the benchmark. So you compare everybody else says manners with the manners of the Prophet ﷺ. This is how you judge people, right? Then the, the second part of the hadith or the second other narration that's collected in the Musnad of Ahmed, that a man came and asked the Prophet ﷺ about bir wal ithm, about righteousness and sin. So the Prophet ﷺ, he told him that as for bir, this righteousness, it will bring peace to your heart that istafti qalbik, uh, ask, your, ask your own heart, ask your own soul. So, and this was something that happened once with Imam Al-Hassan Al-Basri, rahimahullah. Somebody was asking and asking and asking. So he used to tell them, why don't you ask yourself? Give yourself a fatwa before you come to the alim. Right? Like many people, they, they know something is haram, right? But they will go ask this sheikh and that sheikh and that sheikh and that. Like they'll ask 20 shiyu. They already know it's haram, but they're just looking for someone to have a mistake. And no, sheikh so-and-so said it's okay. Right? He just wants some type of uh, support. <laughs> he knows it's wrong, but he's forcing to find some type of support. That, when you feel that way, know for sure this is haram. Just stop. Just give it up. This is a sin. So it's not, it's not going to bring peace to your heart. It will bring you hesitation. You won't be able to sleep at night and so on and so forth. So the heart here in this hadith, it's describing the qalb of a mu'min, which is understood from other hadith of the same narration. Because not everybody's heart is the same. Right? Someone who's sinning left and right, if he asks his heart, his heart will say, yes, sin some more. So, and he, people will say that. No, brother, I feel good doing this. <laughs> because, subhanAllah, your heart has died. Right? So that, that's not what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is talking about. Rather, he's talking specifically about the heart of the mu'min. The believer. The one who has the taqwa of Allah. That before he falls into mistake, he asks himself, he figures it out. And then he knows that this is bad. I'm feeling restless. This is going against the nature that I have. I like doing halal things. I like keeping an honest life. No, I, I can't do this, right? So this is the heart of the believer. Only the heart of the believer is blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to distinguish between right and wrong. And this, this is why one of the tricks of shaitan, and I had mentioned this months ago, one of the tricks of shaitan is to desensitize you meaning make you get used to something right like let's say all these people that watch YouTube and, and, and these other videos that you find everything right and nowadays like you see from time to time like I remember a few months ago here I forgot which city there the uh, I think the 18 year old sister was driving 14 year old sister was a passenger they had a car crash the 18 year old girl is still Facebooking live my sister is dying, we just had a car. Call 911, what's wrong with you? But this is the, the lunacy of the people nowadays. And of course, the sister died. But they, this is what they're doing. Like, their hearts are dead. They have no clue what is right and what is wrong anymore. Because they're watching non-stop on YouTube, this crash video, this person's committing suicide, that person, people become desensitized. You're watching something, watching something, watching something, it becomes normal to you. That's from shaitan. And that's what kills the heart. Like for example, someone can lie, right? Uh, let's, this bag here is blue. And I tell everybody, this is blue, this is blue, this is blue. If I do this for the next two years, eventually, okay man, we believe it, it's blue. Everybody will accept it. 
right? Even a lie. If you lie enough times, <laughs> you believe it yourself, and so do people. Even though they can clearly see it's a lie, but they'll still believe it. That's from shaitan. And that's the nature of Bani Adam. That if you do something repeatedly, it becomes a habit. And there's one action that you have to be very careful of. Salah. Many times, for a lot of Muslims, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, you pray five times a day. This is the bare minimum. But now your job is to check. Are you actually worshipping Allah or is it just habit? Oh, four o'clock, Asr, okay, come to the masjid, pray and leave. What did shaitan do to you? Or Fajr, you wake up, pray Fajr, no khushu, no concentration, no nothing. It's a habit. Just like you have to eat breakfast, drink water, go to the bathroom, Salah became a habit. This, this is not the point of Salah. So you have to stop the shaitan from tricking you. That you concentrate in your Salah. You fight with yourself, Right? Make have khushur, you concentrate. No, it's not just a daily habit that I'm doing. I'm actually worshipping Allah, the best type of worship, making ruku and sujood to Allah. Right? So this is from the uh, tricks of shaitan, that he makes you see, hear certain things, certain amount of times, and your heart accepts it. So you have to be very careful, especially living in these lands, where filth is everywhere. Right? Filth is everywhere. Like if you open your house every single day for the past 20 years, you see a liquor store in front of your house. Eventually, when you hear alcohol is haram, it's not going to affect your heart. Because for the past 20 years, every time you wake up in the morning, you see the liquor store. You have already accepted it in your heart. You'll start thinking, yeah, I know many people drink, this is haram, but alhamdulillah, at least he's not killing anyone. No, haram is haram. It's from the major sins, right? But we start talking that way because shaitan already fooled us, killed our heart because we have been seeing something enough times to think this is now okay, right? So that's the difference between just a Muslim heart and a mu'min or a muhsin's heart. That his heart is always awake. He can distinguish that this is good, this is bad, and so on and so forth, right? So that's the heart that the Prophet ﷺ is talking about. That the pious heart will always know from the get-go, this looks like a bad thing. This just doesn't feel right to me. I don't want to do it. I'm uncomfortable, right? I've never done this. I, I can't, right? I don't want to hear it. I don't want to see it. That's from the pious heart, right? So then the Prophet ﷺ, he then said, as for the evil thing, if your you know, heart is finding uh, uneasy, restlessness, you're fearing Allah, you're you know, dual-minded, again for the pious heart, then know that this is a sin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an that in tattaqullah yaj'al lakum furqana. If you have the taqwa of Allah, then Allah will give you furqan. Furqan is another name for Qur'an. The meaning of furqan is uh, something that makes things clear. Right and wrong becomes clear. That's what the Quran does, right? This is the number one book that tells you clearly what's right and wrong. So that's why Furqan is another name for the Quran. But Allah is saying in this ayah, if you have the taqwa of Allah, He will give you that Furqan in your heart. You will clearly see right from wrong. No one has to tell you. Allah will be your guide. You will clearly see, even if it's something for the first time that you're seeing or hearing, you will get that feeling from Allah that, I don't know, I don't have the dalil, but this just seems to be haram to me, or it's wrong. I don't think this is the right thing to do. Right? So you want to, then you verify and then you justify it. You see if, it's, if you were right or wrong, whatever may be the case. But you follow that. Uh, for safety, you go with your hunch, that feeling that you have, that I have a gut feeling this could be wrong. Stay away from it. If you've received the dalil, the proof that no, you are mistaken, that thing is actually okay to do, no problem. But initially, the right thing is, you have a doubt, you think that this could be wrong, stay away from it. That's the initial reaction, not, hey, I don't know, 
It's okay, if, even if it's wrong, if I find out tomorrow, it's okay, I'll do it today, Allah will forgive me because I don't know. <laughs> right? That's not the initial reaction that you should have. If you don't know something, stay away from it. Right? Stay away from it. That's the whole point. So then, um, the Prophet ﷺ is telling him, uh, telling the person who asked about Bir and uh, Ithim, that ask yourself, that even if you ask yourself, if you go and ask for a fatwa, if you ask for a fatwa, wa in aftak, if you go and aftak and nas, if you ask anyone for a fatwa, it will still, you'll have that uneasy feeling, or aftak, aftak and aftak is, is different in Arabic. Aftak is when you're asking for a fatwa. Aftak is when you're telling somebody okay so aftak you ask aftak you tell so this is the difference so whether you ask someone or someone asks you and you're telling him you'll feel uneasy because you're telling him something wrong right or you ask someone you know this fatwa just seems weird right it seems fishy uh, so you, you you'll get these feelings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but the point is you have to have taqwa Otherwise, you're not going to get that blessing from Allah and you'll just fall into every wrong thing that you hear, uh, so on and so forth. And then you find yourself uh, destroyed. And you look at today's generation. So much complaints from everyone. So much complaints. And the complaints are because one of the main reasons is there's too many fatawa available. Too many. <coughs> There's an answer, for, there's a fatwa for this, a fatwa for that, fatwa for this, everything. And it just increases the complaints, increases the confusions, this and this and that, right? So this is one of, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prophesied that a time would come like this, right? But we have to make the best of it. We are in this uh, situation, but we have to make, make the best of it. <laughs> that how do you distinguish, right? How do you distinguish? That sometimes you so people will ask, okay, Sheikh, I come here, you're the Imam here, I understand that, but I went, I was in some other town, the Imam there told, was saying such and such about the exact same topic. So how, now you're confused. I'm saying one thing, somebody says something else. No problem. It's your responsibility. Open the Quran, read some hadith, and see which one of us is right. You can't just say, Man, these masjids, I go to this masjid, I hear that. I go to that, I, I'm not going to go to any masjid. That's haram for you to do. Your job is to verify the information. Right? I'll, I'll, this, I, I swear by Allah, this is a true story. Once I, this was when I was younger. Like, I think I was like, I don't know, 15, 16 years old. Yeah, too much noise in the back, brothers and child, that's disturbing the listeners. So... I went to some place, there was a, I don't know, some talk going on. So the brother who was giving the lecture at that masjid, he said cucumber, eating cucumber is from the sunnah. Right? Cucumber from the sunnah. Because this was one of the favorite vegetables of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And then he said even to the point, this is a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. Now, this is how people get dis misguided. Who's going to go home and check? Oh, Bukhari, yes, yes, Bukhari. It's right after the Quran. I believe it. No one goes and asks uh, anything, right? Uh, and it was still in the computer era. Go a word, sir. We're not saying go read 6,500 6, hadith, right? You can do a search. Khiyar. Cucumber, whatever, I mean, whatever word, language you speak, Sahih al-Bukhari has been translated into every language. Go and do a word search. Does this word exist? Okay, it exists. Now let me read those hadith. It'll, maybe a dozen hadith or something. And you'll find nothing like that. Where does it say cucumber is the Prophet Wasallam's favorite vegetable? Right? So this happens. So you have to verify. Right? So th this is how you would know. Like I remember, uh, one, one bro who was it, Brother Noor? Yeah, he was telling me one day, like uh, he was asking me something. I told him, 
So he, I think he went somewhere else and he said, you know, the, the, by coincidence, that Shaykh over there was talking about the same thing and I sat and I asked him, what you just said, is this in the Quran? The Shaykh said, no. Is it in Hadith? He said, no. Did the Sahaba do it? He said, no. And the fourth thing he said, you can still do it. <laughs> so Brother Noor came back the next day, guess what just happened? It's like, this was hilarious. <laughs> so we were just laughing about it. So he clearly said it's not in the Quran, it's not in Hadith, and also the Sahaba never did this, but he's telling you, go ahead and do it. <laughs> so so how, how can this be, right? So this is how you would judge the criteria. This is the benchmark. And no one is excused. No one is excused. No one is above the law, right? No one is above the law. Don't be thinking that, no, you know, he's an alim, he's like 50, 60 years old. Because I know in many cultures, you were raised, don't ask questions, just accept, right? right? Yeah. This is wrong. If you don't ask, if, when you don't understand something, how, how will you understand? Like I'm not, I, no, no, don't ask any questions. No, you, are, you have the right. During Q&A, ask. If you didn't understand the material, re, let the teacher repeat so you can understand. Or you have the right. If someone says, like let's say the khutbah I gave last Friday, the three ayat from Surah An'am, right? Of course it's khutbah, you're not writing it down. So many people, uh, which surah did you say it was? Surah An'am, okay, good, good. This is your right. You should ask the, the imam, the sheikh, the teacher, whoever it is. It is your right that what was the reference you gave? Okay, that's it for your own sake. When you have free time, go check it, right? So don't ever be afraid to ask for the reference, right? That if you re repeat, then you write it down, no problem. So this is how you learn truth from falsehood. That yeah, there's widespread fatawa, but you as a Muslim have to do your research. Most of us, we keep thinking that yeah, I don't know, Allah's not gonna ask me. Or I don't want to learn. The more I know, the more I'll be questioned. You can't, you can't intentionally remain ignorant. Nobody thinks this way about the dunya, right? Let's say when the internet became widespread, email, maybe you were still writing letters to Pakistan and Bangladesh, right? But then your kids and nephews, and, what are you doing? Make an email account and send an email. It goes instantly. Did you say, no, it's okay, I don't want to learn. I'll use the hard way. No one says that about dunya issues. So when new things show up that no one ever heard of, they see that this is real, this is true, this is fact, this helps people, people start using it. So what about the deen? Someone will say, no, I never heard this before. No problem. Go open the book and see it. If it's there, alhamdulillah, take it. If it's not there, stick to what you know. So this is how you would go about uh, uh, either turning away from sin and fulfilling uh, righteousness. And <clears throat> you cannot, another excuse that many people use that you know, so and so gave that fatwa. The sin is on him on Yom Al Qiyamah, not me. Right? Like, let's say Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. He has a famous statement, famous statement. Everybody knows this. Anyone who goes into actual studying the religion, they know this statement from Abu Hanifa. He used to say that it is haram for people, it is haram for people to follow my fatwa without reading how I reached that conclusion. He used the word haram. Don't just ask Abu Hanifa a fatwa and you take it. Oh, Abu, no. Read how I reached it. What ayah did I use? What hadith did I use? And he said this for a reason. While you're doing the research, maybe you will find a mistake in him. You don't know. So you don't just blindly follow anyone. None of the ulama, they said, that be muqallidun, meaning blind followers, right? Don't be, don't do taqlid, just blindly following anybody and, uh, and you know, every, well, we can't say Tom, Dick and Harry, every Muhammad and Fatima that you find, right? <laughs> that you just blindly start following whoever says what. So, uh, so the scholars were very strict, right? They were very strict in how knowledge was distributed and that's why those were the golden generations. Right? Golden generations. And then there's another hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. Umm Salama radiallahu anha. She said that the Prophet sallallahu once heard a lot of uh, talking in front of his house. The house of the apartment of Umm Salama. 
Like he, he was with her that night, so the following morning he, he heard, I mean that night he heard a lot of people disputing, arguing this, that. So he came out and he found out that they were disputing, some of the Sahaba were disputing about a fatwa that the Prophet ﷺ gave. The two people were in a dispute, he went, they went to the Prophet ﷺ for a judgment, and the Prophet ﷺ gave a judgment. So he came out and he saw that, no, Rasulullah supported my case, and so it turned into a dispute, right? So the Prophet ﷺ reminded the Sahaba, he came out, I don't know why are you guys arguing in front of my house, right? So he came out and he said that, you know, inni bashar, I'm just a human being. I make mistakes too. My hearing is limited. My understanding is limited. Two people have a problem. They come to me. One person is stronger in how he talks. Another person is weaker. That person, if he does not fear Allah, he can manipulate the meeting. Did you understand? So the Prophet ﷺ said, I'm only human. Allah asked me to, commanded me to pass the judgment based on what I can understand. So I did my job. But if one of you have lied to get a fatwa from me, you took a piece of Jahannam. So that's on you, not the one who's being questioned. Because you lied about the story. What is the Shaykh supposed to do? So Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, he had another famous statement that the ulama or the mufti, right? He is a slave to the one who asks him a question. Any alim, he becomes a slave to the questioner, right? Like let's say you come to me and ask a question. I can only answer based on what you asked me. I, have, I don't know ilmul ghaib. So... <laughs> you become a slave of the person when he's asking a question. So it's upon the questioner, the one who is asking, he has to have the taqwa of Allah and ask truthfully or speak truthfully. But if you are able to manipulate, get a verdict or side on your, uh, sorry, uh, sway the alim or sheikh on your side, you just took a piece of jahannam. So that's your fault, right? That you lied got a fatwa to support yourself, and third, you took the right away from another human being. So you just did three sins at one go. So this was the warning that the Prophet ﷺ gave, right? So a lot of times people tend to think, oh, he answered, it's on him. No, it's a, the questioner has responsibility. You can't just ask any question you want as much as you want, right? Like usually it happens with a lot with the young brothers and sisters. I have a very close friend who has a girlfriend. You don't have a close friend, it's you. That's how they ask the question. Um, <laughs> right? You're talking about yourself. <laughs> but it's okay. Maybe they feel embarrassed, and they should. This is a sin. So alhamdulillah, you know. Uh, but even in private, you know, I have a friend. No, it's, it's okay. No one's here except Allah. Let me answer the question for you properly. So just speak the truth. Right? So I can give you a specific answer. Because not everything is applicable to everyone. Right? Like, let me give you an example. I don't know, maybe someone, uh, something happened in their family, right? Allah forbid his kid had a, got injured and he needs now surgery. His bone broke or something like that. And the brother is, uh, he is thinking of leaving his job, which is haram, but he had health insurance through the job, right? This specific person will come and ask, even if you came and asked, I'm, if I would give this answer too, that this is my son's situation. Qadr Allah, last week he had a, something happen, now he needs a surgery, I don't have forty, fifty thousand dollars 50000 I need this health insurance. We will say to him specifically, you are in a very desperate situation. Just keep your job until this is over. Then you quit your haram job. But what will people do? Yes, yes, we can all keep our heart. No, that fatwa does not apply to you. Not every fatwa will apply to everyone. This is from the deen. This is well known. There are uh, ar meaning general fatwa, and then there are fatwa that are khas, very specific for specific cases, for a specific individual, right? Or people will do now, 
I went to Google, I went to a fatwa site. Yeah, yeah, that sounds similar to my situation. Sheikh so-and-so said such and such. <laughs> this is what happens. And no, you, that's why you're supposed to. Fas'alu ahl dhikr Ask the people of knowledge in kuntum la ta'alamun. If you don't know something, right? So this is why we always tell people. Yes, online, alhamdulillah, all of Sheikh Albani's fatawa are online. All of Sheikh bin Baz's fatawa are online. Ibn Uthaymin's, Ibn Taymiyyah, so many scholars' fatawa are online. Still, the ulama will tell you, ask a sheikh in person. Because you don't have the knowledge if what you read actually applies to you properly. Right? So ask the people of knowledge in person. So the internet is good. You have access to hadith, Quran, tafsir in many languages. This is all good. But there's also some negatives to it too. Everybody starts thinking he's a sheikh, right? I read in that website, or it, what, what's worse, let's say someone read something on the website. A brother is asking, he'll come in. Yeah, yeah, brother, no, don't, no need to ask. I'm telling you, I read it yesterday. <laughs> right? That's even more dangerous. That's more dangerous. So, that let the people whose job is to teach, let them handle it, right? So, or you bring, as like, and you, you want to be part of the conversation, you can ask, you know, Sheikh, I read this stuff yesterday, so what is the understanding of that thing that I heard, because it seems to be related. That's great, you're actually furthering your level of knowledge, that's fine. So these are things that you have to be very careful of, that it, it can really uh, destroy you, uh, destroy your deeds, that if you don't, if you're not serious about uh, learning your religion or seeking the fatawa or asking before doing something, which is the point of this hadith, right? That righteous actions, it means good manners. Now you connect all the whole hadith. That the first sentence is talking about righteous, righteousness is good manners. Then, it, then the Prophet ﷺ is talking about fatawa and the adab of fatawa seeking and telling and this and that. So it, it, it's from good manners, right? It's from the good manners that you approach your religion in a proper way. It's from husn al that you know how to seek fatawa, how to ask, how to tell, and how to research your religion because that deals with your manners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the first most important point that when we talk about manners, right? So many Muslim groups, you find them, they're very widespread. They'll never, ever utter the word Tawheed or Shirk. Never. You can see him talking for 10 years. Not once does he talk about Tawheed, not once does he in, uh, warn against Shirk. But, give charity, smile, do this, do that, do this, do that. Okay, we understand these are all from the good deeds. But what about the good deed with Allah? Respecting Allah, right? So a lot of famous, uh, again, because of this generation of YouTube, there are many du'at, especially in Western countries, right? To gain popularity, they never talk about the real core issues, the basic fundamentals of Islam, which is Tawheed and Shirk. They'll never do it. And so many times people get shocked. I'm not gonna, obviously I'm not gonna mention name uh, because it's not a personal attack on anybody. Ask yourself, Sheikh XYZ. You know, he has a thousand videos on YouTube. Fine. How many of those lectures are about Tawheed? You ask yourself this question, and then you'll know what type of Sheikh he is. If someone has 1,000 videos, and there is only a 10 minute clip in one of those lectures about Tawheed, there is something wrong with this guy. Why doesn't he not want to talk about the number one issue of Islam? Because he'll lose customers. That's what it is. So this is how you would understand. Because a lot of people get shocked. But he has like a million followers on Facebook. It doesn't matter. The Prophet ﷺ, the day he died, only had 100,000. Are you going to brush him off? <laughs> right? So it doesn't matter. Or for so many years, he only had, what, less than 20 followers? Doesn't matter. So the truth is what, uh, or as Ali radiallahu anhu said, men are known by the truth. Truth is not known by men, right? So what happens in our generation, 
Sheikh X said, says this, it must be true. No. What does the Quran say? What does the Hadith say? And if Sheikh X is saying that, then he is true. The judge is the Quran and the Hadith, not him. Right? So you judge the men by the truth, not the other way around. Right? Because this is what most people do. They'll never ask anything. No oh, man, it's from that Sheikh. Okay, what does it matter? Right? So these are things that you have to be very mindful of. This is what has destroyed uh, the community, uh, the Muslim Ummah. Like this one name I can mention. Like let's say Imam Anwar al-Awlaki. Of course he's dead. Allah, he's in Allah's hands. I'm not going to say more than that. He was very popular in the West. Right? But he, is one of, he was one of the main causes of Western children falling into suicide bombing. <coughs> But he was very popular. He talked about the biographies of the prophets. He talked about Jannah, Jahannam. He had a whole series. Everybody was listening to it. And it's because of this one Yemeni that the whole country is now destroyed. He was from Yemen. Right? And so America went into Yemen looking for him. And now look at the country. One Muslim caused the destruction of the whole country. So Allah knows best what's his fate. But this is the reality. So you cannot in this generation go by so-and-so has this many followers, this many... No, you have no idea what things are being said. And then before you know it, you fall into their eloquent speeches and fall into traps. So our judge is always Tawheed. Our judge is the pillars of Iman. Judge is the Quran. Judge is Hadith. Whoever it is, if they're clearly talking based on these things uh, uh, and he's using the tafsir of the Sahaba, not his own opinions, and this and that. This is, we say, this is good, we listen, we stick to him. Not because of him, we stick to him because of the truth, the Quran and the Sunnah. So this is how you would go about living in this generation. Uh, and there's countless ahadith, the, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explaining these concepts, that a time will come. There will be confusion upon confusion. But how do you know what the truth is? You take the Qur'an and my sunnah and the sunnah of Khulafa al-Rashidun. Then you know what the truth is. Just stick to that. Right? So inshallah ta'ala, uh, we have like 15 minutes before Adhan. <coughs> questions, and as usual sisters, you send your questions down. <coughs> yes. Assalamu alaikum. Wa salam. Uh, we have all seen uh, and heard speakers who are very eloquent, very mesmerizing, and and sometimes they do fundraiser, for example, they convince us to empty our pocket, but they themselves don't give it up. Yeah. Uh, so then speaking what they don't, uh, uh, yeah. they don't follow the steps. Also the deen, we feel that if a person who is not following the deen as he should, but he speaks very well, should we take from him? Well, that's a good question. Uh, so it's a two-part question. One is sometimes we find a lot of... Uh, uh, eloquent speakers, uh, they're able to can motivate people to giving a lot of funds if there's a fundraiser, but he himself doesn't give. We don't know his condition. He could be poor. Yeah, you know, he could be poor, you don't know. <laughs> so that one will excuse. Or maybe he gave in secret or he had a conversation with the admin. We don't know. So that we leave it to Allah. But the second part is uh, 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 important that sometimes we see people that they do not practice what they preach, right? They do not practice what they preach. Do we still take knowledge from him? You, you take the knowledge, but you don't take his uh, lack of implementation, right? And this is something, unfortunately, has occurred. And I've heard, it doesn't matter whether you meet uh, Bengali Muslims or Pakistani Muslims or Arab Muslims or Bosnian Muslims or Chechen Muslims, everyone has a, as a, as a common statement. <laughs> like they'll make fun of many Imams. Do as I say, don't do as I do. <laughs> yeah, and this is sad. This is a sad reality of many people. Because back in the day, like let's say Imam Bukhari, when he used to teach, or whatever may be the case, and even when he was learning, you had to have permission from other teachers to just sit in the class. We're not talking about speaking. Just to be a student of Imam Bukhari, 
Other scholars had to give you tazkiyah, we give you permission, yes, go take this and then Imam Bukhari will sit you down. Just to learn, like it's a masjid. Not anybody can just know, who are you? You're not, quali you're not qualified to learn, let alone speak, right? So Islam was heavily protected. But nowadays, a lot of people learn, right? A lot of people learn and then they start speaking. Different people have different intentions, right? I personally know some brothers, they graduated from Medina University, studying for seven, eight years. But when you see him, you won't even know. And then you ask, ah, I just went there because my father wanted me to be a sheikh. You are the absolute last person who should have gone there. Because these type of things has to come from your own. Not just that your father told you, you go do it. No, this is the religion you're studying. Right? Or uh, someone else will say, no, oh, I, you know, there's a lot of invites and this and that. No, you're, you're in the game for the wrong reason. Right? So if this is how you're thinking, it cannot be. And, and this is unfortunately common with a lot of Western raised children. A lot of them. I know some brothers, again, may Allah give them hidayah. If you invite them, you have to give them coffee and it has to be from Starbucks. What if I get you a Wawa? No, no, not Wawa. It has to be from Starbucks. Did you learn the deen for this? <laughs> right? So there's people like this. I mean, there is, unfortunately, this is the reality of the ummah we live in. Everybody knows the <clears throat> that... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for, for me, Wawa is the best. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's the cheapest too, just a dollar. <laughs> so, so, uh, so the thing is, this is the problem with a lot of Western raised children that go into studying. They did not feel this shortage, right? So they don't know how to deal with these shortages of life. Sometimes it's going to happen, right? I remember a long time ago, and this is just one example. There's many, many. I flew from Maryland all the way past the Midwest. I'm not going to say the state's name because, you know, this goes live. So let people figure it out. So back and forth. So I went. I didn't, you know, nobody told me. So somebody asked a question. It was about riba. So I gave an answer. The president of the masjid was a general manager for Bank of America. <laughs> I didn't know. So the plane ticket came out of my own pocket. They didn't even pay for it. Because he was so angry, he didn't even reimburse me for the ticket. So how, what was what? <laughs> but hey... We got to do what we got to do, right? So Alhamdulillah, it'll happen. Sometimes it's going to happen, stuff like that. That's, that's, <laughs> so, <laughs> but this is what it is. It goes on from both sides. Whether it's, uh, or I remember in Philadelphia, they brought a, a, a chef from Philistine. Uh, he was very well qualified. He was the imam there for like three months. They fired him. What happened, chef? And he was very close with me. I was like, what happened? I said, uh, you know, he was speaking like selling uh, pork is haram. And I got fired because I didn't know. Three brothers from the management, they had uh, butcher shops where they even sold pork. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they fired the imam. So I was like, how am I supposed to know? Even if I did know, I still have to teach the religion, right? So these are the realities of the world we live in. And th these are the things that kill the ummah, right? It, Christians and Jews are not doing this to us. We do this to ourselves, right? So this is what's very important. So back to what he was saying, that sometimes you will find people, they speak good. You take that knowledge. This is Abdullah ibn Abbas said this. We take the truth from wherever it comes from, right? And if you know something, right? If you know something, uh, bad about the person you have been, you take him that listen you have a huge responsibility you're teaching the religion and you're doing such and such you should fix yourself that's your job right but if he's still not listening and it becomes a public affair then of course you stop the person uh, from being involved right like for example sometimes you pe find people and it's shocking but it's true a person uh, he has been divorced 21 times. 21 times. 
because every town he goes to to give a lecture, he marries a woman. Before leaving, he divorces her. <laughs> All right? This this is real stuff. You know, people are like that, unfortunately. This is now a public issue. You have to tell everybody, hey, this guy, this is proof. Here are all the ladies you can talk to them. They will testify. Here's our marriage certificate. We got divorced within a week. This person needs to stop giving dawah because it's actually harming public people. Or somebody might say, he comes and does a fundraise. <laughs> you, <laughs> you guys have experience. <laughs> somebody will come for a fundraiser and say, I'm from this masjid. It's for himself. <laughs> <laughs> so when you find people like that, you have to warn other Messiah. Like, listen, we got cheated. Please don't invite him, right? We don't want your community to suffer, right? So uh, these are things then you would make it public. But other than that, you know, lesser than that, take the knowledge, don't take his manners. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, you mentioned that uh, to seek the truth, we can do a Twitter search for Kari as a person. Yeah. So sometimes I'm watching a video on YouTube and based on their algorithm, whatever I'm watching, I like it, they give me 10 of the links to... to yeah, to recommended to videos on the side. Right, so I'm still watching uh, uh, the first one when I remember I have to research uh, Bukhari for this. Yeah. And it gives me five uh, hadiths to read through and those 10 links are still waiting on YouTube. So what can <laughs> I do? No, that, that, you have to, that's called fighting your nafs to acquire actual knowledge, right? So now something simple, this is a, uh, since you know this is coming up. As being part of the awam, lay people, don't pressure yourself by listening and learning 10, 15 different topics all at once, right? Like take things step by step. Like even when you go study, if you see, there's a process that they follow in any institution, or if you uh, sit under any of the ulama, there's a step-by-step -step process. What happens to a lot of lay people, they want to learn everything in one day. And that's what causes the confusion. That you're watching a lecture on, I, I, I don't know, a salah. And then, oh, zakat, this, there's a recommended video on zakat. You don't even have money. Wait until you get the money to learn about zakat, right? Just don't overwhelm yourself. Salah, whether you are poor or rich, you have to pray. So this is number one. Learn it properly. So that's from shaitan to distract you. Right? Because shaitan never wants to pay for you. He'll make you run around here, 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 here. So today you're learning this. Tomorrow you're learning that. Tomorrow, this is not the way to do it. Topic by topic by topic by topic. Step by step. This is how you acquire knowledge. Because shaitan will make you think, hey, you're 45. You don't have much time. Learn it. No. As long as you are learning, that's what Allah cares about. That this uh, slave of mine is making sincere effort. Every day he's learning something. And he's going. He has the niyyah to learn as much as he can till the day he dies. Good enough. You follow that step-by-step -step process. So don't let shaitan fool you, right? That somebody's asking about... And this actually happens with, with people when they're asking questions. They're asking a question about ghusl. All of a sudden, he's going to ask about, a, about chicken. Then all of a sudden, he's going to ask about hajj. Then all of a sudden, what are you doing? Because shaitan is bringing those questions to his mind. That you, you don't even let me finish the answer. No, 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 just stick to the topic, right? So one by one, one by one. So this is how you would uh, go about it. Don't let shaitan distract you with all sorts of things. <coughs> I think the sisters got occupied with the crying baby tonight. So no questions. Yeah, Talha. I can. Uh, this is off topic. Like sometimes at school, like your classmate asks you, like, yeah, if you don't talk about Halloween or something like that, and like, like the other Muslims do. Like, why do that? <coughs> yeah, this is a very good question. See, kids, uh, mashallah, they're a lot more advanced, and they think. So Talha is asking that you know sometimes in school, uh, the non-Muslims will ask, how come you don't do Halloween? But we saw the other Muslims doing Halloween. Okay, since it's tonight is Halloween, that's why he's good. But this applies to everything. They'll ask one Muslim girl, why don't you wear the hijab, but those girls do, right? And, and this, is, this actually puts Muslims to shame by the Qadr of Allah through the hands of non-Muslims. It's from Allah. We, we have to be honest that Muslims are not all on the same page. 
right? They're not all on the same page. So th that's problem number one. Now, number two, of course, when a non-Muslim asks you, it's the same thing. That just like you guys don't have all Christians at the same level of practice, we don't have all Muslims at the same level. Uh, maybe they don't know, right? Maybe they don't know. That could be also the reason they were not taught. Uh, because in this day and age, time is short. People don't really think about learning their religion. But as far as I know, this is from my religion, and this is how you would go about it, right? And then, advise your Muslim brothers that you see are doing this wrong. So go sit down with them, hey, you know, this just happened, they were asking why I don't do it, you do it, or whatever may be the case. So what's your reason? Maybe he didn't know, right? So you can open a conversation with your brothers too. Right? So, but the thing is, when the non-Muslim asks you these type of questions, you have to honestly answer to them, right? Because you cannot, right? You, you, you can't cheat someone from learning about Allah. Like, this happens to a lot of sisters. That, hey, I, under, I heard that in Islam you have to cover yourself, so why don't you cover? What do most women do? Oh, it's not really required. You just told someone the wrong thing about Allah and His religion. Maybe the person wanted to take the... Sh you don't know, maybe he'll ask more about the religion and actually want to become Muslim, but you just gave, oh, okay, all right, then, then, all right, no problem. So you can be honest that I'm struggling with myself, but actually in our book it does say that. But I'm, I'm struggling, hopefully I can do it too. I'm in the process, something, like an honest answer. So it, it gives that person the value of Islam, that we have to focus on Islam's image, not my image. That's the mistake we make, right? I don't want them to look bad at me. No, we don't want people to look bad on Islam, at Islam, right? We want our religion to look perfect the way it is. The religion should look as beautiful as it really is. That should be our target, right? And they'll actually respect you. They'll respect you for it, right? Uh, and it will be from Allah that you do a good deed. Allah will protect your honor as well. All right, if, uh, any other questions? So sisters, last call. You either throw your questions down or we'll stop the lecture tonight. Right. Okay, inshallah. Okay, it's time for that.